Hi, I'm Chris and you're watching the Proud To Be Green channel. We've had a fantastic few months here at Proud To Be Green HQ, talking to lots of businesses who are all doing huge things for the environment. And it's great to see them coming on board. Recently, we've been out and about taking photos and videos of our members. And we've also had the pleasure of watching the premiere of Breakwater, a film about the harm of marine litter. Later in this video, we'll be sharing our interview with Emma Askew, the mastermind behind the documentary. So keep watching to find out more. In recent news, you've probably heard that the Amazon rainforest is currently on fire. Not just wildfires, but actively being burnt. It's been fascinating watching the international reaction to these fires after the hashtag Pray for Amazonias appeared a couple of weeks ago. After this gained the attention of the media, things really started moving, with governments threatening trade sanctions against Brazil, unless they sorted out the situation. However, before this, it wasn't news at all. Fires in the Amazon are not new. August to October is the dry season, or as dry as you get in a rainforest. And traditionally, it's the time when farmers and other groups burn a certain amount, legally and illegally. But the number of fires has risen uh, from this amount last year. This year, the fires are more ferocious than ever. Thousands of acres of virgin forest are being engulfed by thousands of fires across some of the most remote regions of Brazil. But this year, the international community has been inflamed by the rhetoric of the new Brazilian president, Jair Bolsonaro. The outrage and anger directed at Bolsonaro have been over his policies, which have allegedly encouraged logging and other agricultural activities that directly threaten the forest, as well as the indigenous people who are naturally the victims of this tragedy. Recently, he accused environmental agencies of starting the fires as they were running out of money. He has since backtracked on his comments, but unfortunately, the Brazilian government has been less than accommodating to the offers of help from the G7 countries who offered the $22 million to help towards fighting the fires, which Bolsonaro uh, refused. $22 million? Really, guys? You get the feeling that they're scraping the bottom of their pockets with that, which is frankly a pathetic figure given the importance of the Amazon forest. The attitude of Bolsonaro's right-wing pro-agribusiness government has been very much, it's our forest, you can't tell us what to do, even though the implications of the fires have been felt as far away as Sao Paulo and 2,000 miles away, and the implications that further fires could have on the world's climate. Should we care that happens in the Amazon rainforest? Yes! Ultimately, the function of the Amazon is critical to generating rainfall in South America and Argentina and the North American Midwest, and beyond through uh, beyond through evapotranspiration to think about rivers in the sky. And the proximity of Brazil at the equator it keeps it cool as well. But it can have repercussions on agriculture in the area, and not just the fact that it produces the 6% of the world's oxygen, and not just 20, seriously, Google it. The Amazon also acts as a great carbon sink, yet in the last half a century it has lost 300,000 square miles of forest, which has negated its function as the world's largest carbon sinks after the oceans. Even so, the fires are releasing centuries of carbon back into the atmosphere. I've linked to a fascinating article in the description below that appeared on The Intercept by Alexander Zaitchik, which gives a fascinating insight to the current situation. He writes, Scientists have warned that losing another fifth of Brazil's rainforest will trigger the feedback loop known as dieback, in which the forest begins to dry out and burn in a cascading system collapse beyond the reach of any subsequent human intervention or regret. This would release a doomsday bomb of stored carbon, disappear the cloud vapour that consumes the sun's radiation before it can be absorbed as heat, and will shrivel the rivers in the basin and in the sky. The climate crisis is a pressing and urgent problem that affects the entire planet. The need for change is something that we all must take responsibility for, but the journey to a global consensus is a long way off. Before we know it, we will be reaching that tipping point and our planet will be beyond the point of no return. The situation in the Amazon is something we should all be concerned about. I'm here with Emma Askew, environmentalist, campaigner and mastermind behind the stunning Breakwater documentary that myself and Charlotte got to see uh, last Saturday. It was the Saturday before, wasn't it, um, at the Exeter Phoenix. What do you do? And tell us a bit about yourself. So I'm a full-time environmental consultant and I also work part-time as a Southwest rep for Surfs Against Sewage. 
And I love environmental research, and hence with my filmmaking, I love making it creative and drawing the creativity into it. And I think everyone's heard about Surfers Against Sewage, but if not, um, what is their background and what do they do? Surfers Against Sewage was formed um, by a group of surfers that loved the sea and wanted to protect the sea. And it's grown um, from campaigns, talks to national scale projects, and it's now across the nation and we have plastic free communities, um, nationwide beach cleans. Um, so it's, it's ocean conservation that is spread and across society and it empowers individuals to take that action. I think actually at the premiere, um, you've now got international interests, haven't you? Yes, we have. It's yeah. spread massively and we hope it just keeps going. It's one community after another and as soon as individuals want to take um, that action and want to lead it, it can go so far, so it's exciting. Fantastic. So when we talk about marine litter, um, what can this cover? Because it's not just about plastic bottles, is it? No, it's um, a common misconception actually, and people assume that um, it's mainly plastic or it's just plastic, and it is a big bulk of it is plastic, unfortunately, but it covers anything from cigarette butts to fishing gear, to food wrappers, um, anything that shouldn't be in the sea. And um, in fact, in the name of Surfs Against Sewage, it was a common problem when Surfs Against Sewage formed as a charity, um, that sewage was the issue, it was polluting the ocean, and now it's definitely more a form of litter that's polluting the ocean from littering in cities, from littering in beaches, and that all ends up in the ocean. It's a basic question, and I feel, I feel a bit silly asking it, but for people who aren't quite aware of the situation. Um, why are plastics and marine litter so harmful to the oceans and their inhabitants? Yeah, so when I do a lot of school talks as well as um, talks to companies or talks to universities, the common question is actually why, like why is it bad? And it's because, well, what I always say is that it, it doesn't actually break up, it doesn't degrade, it will stay in the ocean wow. unless you remove it. So you actually need to stop it at source, mm -hmm. otherwise mm -hmm. it, it will inevitably be an issue. Yeah. Um, in your experience, what's the most, uh, the most ecologically concerning thing that ends up in our oceans? I, mean, I know there's lots mm -hmm. of different things, but there must be sort of a particular yeah. thing that kind of... For me, from experience, experience at yeah. beach cleans, and yeah. um, especially with schools, it's actually fishing gear, so like fish hooks from um, rope, anything like that. Because um, when, you, when I work with schools, they're, they're not allowed for health and safety issues as well to touch hooks. And we seem to find an awful lot of fishing gear, a fishing line and rope, and, and everyone kind of assumes um, that that industry is very good at looking after the ocean. Um, but I think there is a major issue that they need to actually be more careful. A lot of ghost fishing gear, it doesn't matter if it's by accident, if it still ends in the ocean, it's going to stay. Mm. And a lot of it's made out of plastics, mm. like the ropes, um, so it won't degrade mm. and um, it will inevitably turn into microplastics. So a bit more about um, the documentary. Um, what was the inspiration behind uh, the Breakwater documentary? And can you describe the moment when you realised that your message uh, was going to take the form of a documentary, you know, that it was going to be visual? Yeah, so I started off with Surf Skin Sewage doing just beach cleans and I found it really hard to inspire people in the two minutes that I'd speak to people and they'd always want to know more and they'd want to know why I'm doing beach cleans and then as well as it kind of spread across the UK everyone was doing beach cleans so I wanted to get a bit more creative with it and I wanted to kind of see where I could take it and see where it would go and hence I, I love film and I love um, photography as well so I got some of my local creatives involved and thought, let's just do a project, let's do a film. Um, and I also felt that a lot of marine litter films were quite doomsday and they were quite depressing yeah, in that sense. Yeah. I never felt inspired, I felt either upset by it or moved by it, mm -hmm. um, which does, it's a very important part of acting, it's, yeah. it's realising that you must do something about it. Um, but I wanted something um, or to make something that would empower people and I saw so much um, action was going on in Devon. I saw people leading organisations like Plastic Free Exeter, um, I saw people creating artwork, um, all sorts of exciting 
pieces of action that everyone I felt needed to get credit for and once you celebrate that it motivates others to get involved and a positive outlook actually is incredibly important to motivate a large scale audience whilst I do think the pessimistic view might be effective short term because inevitably people will start thinking, oh, but what can we do anyway? And it's kind of a shrugged attitude. So as soon as you empower people and with this film, I hoped to inspire people as much as I found um, the action across Devon was very inspiring for myself. So I really wanted to motivate that within people. I have to say, I like the balance that you got because it wasn't doom and gloom, it was inspirational. And at the same time, it was also, with the footage, it was really beautiful as well. Yes. It was really beautifully Thank shot. You. Um, how did you meet the team uh, that you worked on the project? Did mm. you all kind of know each other beforehand or did you, or was it kind of yeah. a call out? So it, I worked with a close friend to do sports to start off filming my beach clean. And I started to really love people's reactions. Some of the kids really, really kind of wanted to get involved, especially as it was being filmed. So it was exciting. And from then, I, I decided that I wanted more beautiful, kind of stunning and motivated imagery from the sky. So I got um, a local contact that owned a drone. And then another friend of a friend did underwater footage. And then um, I got connected to someone who loved composing music in which they were all incredibly talented. And I, as soon as I pitched my idea to them and explained why I wanted to do this film, they were all very on board. So it was a very natural process. How do you feel the premiere went? How did people react to the documentary? Were you happy with how people reacted? Yeah, I was. I was, um, I was really moved, actually, by the positive response because I, I had a lot of family and friends supporting me and I knew that they'd love the film and they'd just be excited to see what I've done with it. But the fact that we had a lot of the audience that were university students, local businesses, and that hadn't seen the project at all and we got such a positive response... So it really, it really fulfilled me with the sense that we, we inspired them and a lot of people came up after the event asking to be involved in Service Against Sewage or Plastic Free Extra and they wanted to know who to contact to get involved. So I do feel that it was just what we wanted to achieve and it motivated people. And has there been anyone in particular um, that's been a kind of an inspiration to you or a key motivator in the Breakwater Project? Yeah, definitely. I would say the CEO of Surf Against Sewage, Hugo, he is extremely driven and the way he's created a charity that is purely based from celebrating local action and giving the individuals that responsibility, it's, it's genius. And was there anything in particular that you enjoyed the most about making the documentary? I can imagine a lot, yeah. it was all, you know, it's really, yeah. it might be quite hard to answer, but was there anything in particular... Definitely, actually, one moment that really stood out was with um, St Peter's Primary School in Budley Salterton. And I went to go and do a little talk there about marine litter, and um, I was expecting to be quite basic about it. Um, the school knew an incredible amount. They were actually only year six, and um, they were all so enthusiastic. It's probably because they're such a coastal school, and they really wanted to look after their beach. So they were very enthusiastic and they really wanted to write letters to McDonald's to stop them using single-use plastics. And um, I wasn't even going to go into microplastics during the talk. And I actually had a question about microplastics. And it blew me away because it showed me that you can't underestimate the young and that they, they do really want to help and they know a lot more than you think. So you need to give them that confidence that, oh, yeah, you can do it. And then they just run with it, and that's where it, that's where the action happens. So it's, yeah, really, really inspiring. I can imagine Breakwater isn't the end for your campaigning. Um, what's next yeah. for you and Breakwater? So, yes, I hope it's not the end. I'm extremely excited to push it further um, and see where it goes. I wanted the premiere event to incorporate interaction with the production team as well as the issue and, and local organisations so I'm hoping to take Breakwater with, with it as an event across different communities across the UK to set an example and to inspire other communities to get involved and, and who knows we can make further films for different communities and to celebrate their local action 
Um, but I think it's really important that we keep pushing this project. So I'm definitely pushing it out there and seeing who's interested and, and where it will take us, film festivals, different events, um, or maybe a different Breakwater second film. <laughs> I think we should do a Breakwater um, yeah. part two, a Would... sequel, <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I'm very excited to see where it goes, but this is definitely the start, and now we've received a positive reaction. We just want to keep pushing it. Do you, you know, in your personal opinion, do you think that we'll ever be able to undo the damage that certainly plastics and marine litter have caused um, in our lifetime? That's a very good question. And I think that through just something like Beach Cleans itself, um, won't necessarily touch the surface because about 70% of the marine litter in the ocean will sink to the bottom of the ocean. So a lot of it's there already. And whether we clean it manually um, out of the ocean, it will stay there. But I think it's important to stop it at source and to change the way people live and to change how people view their lifestyle with single-use plastics in particular, as well as disposing plastics. Um, for example, educating people um, to not drop litter on the streets, to not drop it on the beach. It should be common habit to pick it up. So, and I do think that's changing. There's a lot of change happening. And I think we do need to keep doing that and keep up that pressure to prevent further damage. Um, but I think the reality is that we need to work very hard to remove it completely. Um, but no, I don't think it's impossible. Thank you so much for asking our questions. No worries. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Keep green and have a great weekend.